when did you observe that herbivores were important for the maintenance of biodiversity in tropical forests, especially in Mexico, in Los Tuxlas? Yeah, so it turns out that um, due to a number of historical reasons, I was appointed to be the director of the Los Tuxlas Research Station. That's um, in the mid to late 80s, when I was a young man. And, um, you know, living there, being physically present in the field station for, you know, week after week, day and night, actually living physically there, I began to notice some very interesting patterns. For example, I had been studying herbivory pretty much um, as a legacy of what I had done in my PhD with slugs and snails and, and clover plants, and I was measuring rates of herbivory. So, well, there was something that really um, was very intriguing. The amount of da uh, herbivory damage that I was finding in my plants, I had permanent plots, very much a herbarian approach to doing ecology, I was not detecting any vertebrate damage in my plants. So that was one thing. The other thing that was really very striking is Los Tuxtlas has these amazing seedling carpets, you know, dominated by a few species in a patch, another, another species in another patch. And I began to think maybe this is not quite so normal. I mean, I, the fact that I don't see any vertebrate damage at all, and the fact that some plants dominate locally in, in the physical space and patches. So that was kind of the biological observation. But at the same time, the fact that I was living there, and sometimes I could hear the shotguns, for example, or sometimes I actually run into people, you know, with some peccaries on their backs and things like that, I began to make a connection uh, in terms of, is it possible that, uh, you know, these human impacts on the, on the mammalian fauna of this place relates to the fact that I don't see any evidence of mammalian herbivory on those plants. So that was one component. And another one which is really very Costa Rican and very much um, uh, Costa Rican oriented is the fact that Dan Jansen had to do this study on the Corcovado National Park to look at the impact of gold mining. And he invited me to be part of the team. And in that team, we discovered that one of the most prevalent activities of these gold miners um, was the hunting. And so we began to take, uh, to, to take data and evidence, you know, very quick evidence in, in terms of, for example, fruits that would be lying on the ground without being consumed, seedling carpets and things like that. So all of those things combined made me think that maybe there was a connection between those patterns of herbivory that I was detecting in the understory of Los, of Los Tuxtlas with the fact that animals were not very evident. And of course, one is always uh, you know, deceived by the fact that you don't see the animals because they're very secretive, many of them are nocturnal. So it was not very clear to me until I then began to actually test the hypothesis to what extent is this a, a sort of a human impact that is driving these patterns of herbivory. The way to approach that at the time was to go and find another tropical rainforest area in which I could um, have certainty that the mammalian composition, that the mammalian fauna would be in good shape. That took a long time for me to find a place to compare Los Tuxlas with. Right? Los Tuxlas, I was imagining that would be the deformated side, and I was going to, uh, looking for another place that would be the place to compare it with. It took a long time, but eventually I found an amazing site in the southeast of the country, close to the border with Guatemala. It's a place called Montes Azules, a fantastic biological preserve, biosphere reserve, uh, still in, uh, present in Mexico in fantastic shape. So I decided to um, have my student at the time, Alvaro Miranda, hence the papers Dirso and Miranda, when we started to compare the two sides, and then we, went, we began to see, you know, for me being a person used to a place such as Los Tuxlas, coming to this place where tap tapers, peccaries, a deer, and everything was so common in normal abundances, and began to see the types of damage that I was missing in that other place, that was a kind of an eye-opener that, that it sort of uh, directed me to really consider that the absence of the big animals can have a tremendous impact on the structure and diversity of the forest on this territory.